Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sabine Silke, and as the director of the North American Studies Program and the German Canadian Center of the University of Bonn, I welcome you to the eighth event in our lecture series, The White House Embattled the US Election 2020. And I welcome in particular, of course, our guest speaker, Candice Kerstan, who joins us from Pennsylvania. Good afternoon, Ms. Kerstan. We're very happy to have you and learn more of a part of the election process that is generally left by the wayside, the electorate constituted by many US, American living, US Americans living somewhere abroad. Good afternoon. And of Good course, afternoon. <laughs> and of course, we would much rather interact with you and our audience face to face. The idea was that you visit uh, my seminar on the occasion of the 2020 election. And yet, zooming our way through the series of lectures at a safe distance also makes our long distance conversation possible, which of course is wonderful. Uh, plus, uh, with the temperatures in Bonn, we can be happy not to be in one of our seminar rooms. As most of you know, uh, by this time our events are a co-production organized in cooperation with the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung and the America House in Cologne. And again, my gratitude goes to both institutions for all their support um, and for a wonderful cooperation. Once again, a few words on procedures uh, this afternoon. We will have a Q&A session at the end, but for now, we have you muted, um, and uh, that allows, of course, for better transmission. And there is yet another very important note. This afternoon and evening was meant to be a double feature. After the talk on Democrats abroad, we had scheduled at 6.15, Professor Dr. Ulrich Schlie's lecture on the foreign policy agenda of the next president, which is sort of an interesting title uh, because it looks into a future that we don't know yet. Unfortunately, Dr. Schlie had to cancel his, tour, uh, his talk, but uh, we hope very much to be able to reschedule it in the fall before or after the election. Now, our lectures have engaged the upcoming election from multiple directions, and this afternoon it is yet again from transatlantic perspectives, yet of one that is of a very different kind, focused on the political work of the Democrats abroad. For Candice Karastan is the chair of Democrats Abroad Germany, the official representation of the US Democratic Party here an office she has held since February of 2019. We'll hear, hear more about this organization, of course, but just for starters, Democrats Abroad is a volunteer organization aimed at mobilizing the approximately 9 million American citizens living outside the US to vote for Democratic candidates. They organize events such as the recent Black Lives Matters and Juneteenth events, protesting police violence and systemic racism in the United States. Democrats abroad also provide advice on voter registration. And most important, perhaps, they aim at mobilizing voters abroad. Now, let me tell you more about our speaker. Candice Karastan comes from Hunting Huntingdon in central Pennsylvania about halfway between Pittsburgh and the state capital of Harrisburg, and this is where she's now. She received her BA in political science and German from Juniata College, a small liberal arts college in her hometown. Her BA thesis was entitled Creating a Cleaner America, Learning Through German Renewable Energy Policy Success. After spending a study abroad semester at the University of Marburg in 2013, she moved to Germany for good in 2015 to pursue an MA in political science, which she completed last year with a thesis on cultures of organized interest, the development and implications of interest representation in Germany and the United States. Next to acting as a summer study abroad coordinator for the Academy of International Education across the road here in Bonn, she has been working as an academic editor and translator at our university's Kete Hamburger Center for Advanced Study in the Humanities, which is focused on law as culture since 
2016. Earlier this year, she became a research associate and PhD candidate at the Keta Hamburger Center, and her dissertation will focus on overseas absentee voting policy, a subject she knows very well, of course, through her work for Democrats abroad. As chair of that organization, she was frequently interviewed during the primary session season by media like TRT World, RBB Kultur, and um, the Süddeutsche Zeitung. Ms. Karasan, we look very much forward to hearing more about the Democrats abroad and the potential of American voters living overseas. So the floor or the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Professor Silke. Um, I'm very excited to be here today and I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to cooperate uh, with my alma mater, the University of Bonn, and uh, spread the word about all of the exciting uh, work that Democrats Abroad is doing to get out the overseas vote. So I'll go ahead and load my presentation. Okay, so as you'll see, my presentation will focus on the overseas voting population, Americans abroad, and discuss what role they're going to play in the 2020 race, and I'll ultimately make the argument uh, that overseas voters should not be overlooked this election cycle, uh, and also in future election cycles. To give you a quick overview of how I will run through my presentation, I'd like to present you with some background on absentee voting, um, and then particularly absentee overseas voting. Uh, running through the history of how this came about, which rights Americans overseas have uh, when it comes to their participation in elections back in the United States. We'll then take a look at overseas voters and their engagement in previous election cycles, and then take that knowledge to explore the potential for the 2020 election cycle and the power of the overseas vote. Okay, so to begin, again, I just wanted to overview the process of absentee voting. From the, we hear absentee voting uh, immer, uh, always more and more in terms of mo uh, vote by mail. We see that in the primary season, but where does that actually come from? So the process of absentee voting really materialized during the U.S. Civil War when large numbers of Americans were away from home. Politicians, of course, wanted their votes. They also wanted to make sure that the military population in particular was not disenfranchised. Prior to the Civil War, there were some scattered efforts uh, to do voting by proxies, particularly with the Continental Army back with the Revolutionary War. But again, this didn't really materialize until the US Civil War. It was introduced by the Lincoln administration and the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, was particularly influential in making uh, absentee voting policy a reality. Some of the basis for this was again that the democratic society that the Lincoln administration was fighting for should include all legal voters who wish to vote. So again it came down to expanding uh, the electorate during the 1864 election in particular. As a result of the Lincoln administration's efforts, 25 states would change their voting policy to allow military voters uh, or the soldiers to vote while they were away. Uh, in many instances, we saw field stations pop up uh, where military voters could go and cast a ballot, or as we know uh, very well today, to vote by mail. This was a big change in terms of who was voting and the opinions that were being represented because soldiers could directly relay their concerns to candidates, particularly their stances on uh, how the candidates were responding or influencing the war at the time. Uh, as a result, in the 19, or 1864 election, approximately 150,000 soldiers were able to vote for the first time. Um, and this was really the first moment in American history where there was widespread absentee voting. Of course, in an interesting parallel to today, with this expansion of voting uh, absentee, there was strong opposition in the 19th excuse me, 1864 race, um, many of the Democrats at the time were warning of rampant voter fraud here. I have a, a scheme by Republicans to gain some great advantage to their party. And that was said by a state senator in Wisconsin. Uh, 
Um, nonetheless, absentee voting, as I mentioned, uh, was allowed at least with 25 states and again, a massive expansion of the electorate. We saw this again in World War II, uh, particularly World War I, but especially World War II sealed the deal when it came to uh, overseas voter participation uh, for the military. Uh, in World War II, 1944 election, there were 3.2 million absentee votes cast uh, that would help get FDR elected for his fourth term at the White House. One last interesting note on absentee voting, and we see this uh, again from the Civil War through World War I, again through World War II, Vietnam War, is this expansion of the electorate uh, through absentee voting, particularly during times of war. And in the context of the corona crisis, I would just add again, we have this concept and notion of war with the invisible enemy, and again, massive uh, absentee voting efforts. In my home state of Pennsylvania, uh, we switched to mail-in voting um, automatically without any, um, you don't have to have a reason not to be at the polling place this time around. So it'll be interesting uh, to see, but this dialogue of voting by mail and war uh, is very, very uh, linked to each other. So that particular slide focused on the military, but I now want to shift over to the overseas civilian population. Uh, particularly in the 1960 and 1964 election cycle, we did see the overseas civilian population becoming more engaged with US politics. There was also at the same time a lot more consideration of overseas citizens and civilian population from politicians and press back in the United States. Uh, a lot of the campaigns were starting to pay more attention, particularly uh, to American groups in London and Paris. And at the time, uh, I have here engagement because at the time, uh, US civilian citizens who were living overseas did not yet possess the right to vote from abroad. And again, just to highlight here, this notion that there was more engagement from the civilian population overseas and also more attention back in the US. Uh, I have here one selected clip from the New York Times in 1964, uh, where you'll see that the Times is putting particular emphasis on overseas voters getting their opinions uh, at home and abroad. So you have this article, Americans in Asia, uh, and a particular segment on US election abroad where they're hearing from Americans living in London, Paris, Tokyo, Moscow. So there is this representation coming back to the United States of the voices from Americans living overseas. However, as I mentioned, while they were hearing the voices, there still was not any formal representation. Uh, that changed in 1964 with the formation of Democrats Abroad. Um, as Professor Zika mentioned, Democrats Abroad is the official arm of the U.S. Democratic Party for Americans living overseas. And that again came into play in 1964. Uh, pre predominantly groups in London and Paris that today has expanded to countries all over the world. Uh, we have official country committees as we call them in 45 countries, including Germany. At the same time, uh, the Democrats abroad worked together with Republicans to form the Committee for Absentee Democrats Abroad Voting. That is the group that would then go to Washington and lobby particularly for the enfranchisement of overseas voters. And that would happen for the next 10 years, again, fighting for the right for the overseas civilian population to also gain the right to vote from abroad. I did just want to point out in this context, uh, I get this question often, with Democrats abroad, is there any Republican equivalent and what is their history? Uh, there is a Republicans overseas group as well, and I think you'll hear from them in just a few days. Uh, I did just want to quickly highlight the difference. Uh, Republicans overseas came into being in its current form in 2013. Uh, so that's why you will not see them listed here. And there are just a few minor differences in terms of the structure and function. So Democrats Abroad, as I mentioned, is the official party, Republicans overseas, however, does not have any official recognition within the Republican Party. Um, and again, we're not involved back in 1964, as they just came into being recently. Having said that, uh, 
there was still Republican cooperation again with the absentee Democrats abroad voting, and that group would fight for the next 10 years until the Overseas Citizens Voting Rights Act of 1975 was passed uh, and signed into law by Gerald Ford in 1976. About 10 years later, we see the passage of another monumental uh, law for overseas voters entitled the Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act. This law, in contrast to the one in 1975, which was the first step to enfranchising overseas voters, 1986 is where we see uniformity, so to say, across the board and how military and civilian citizens can vote. Uh, with the Uniform and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act, we saw the standardization of the process uh, in terms of how people submit. So now there's one uniform form, and there has been since 1986, called the Federal Postcard Application. And that is how Americans living overseas, whether military or civilian, uh, submit for an absentee ballot. I did also just want to highlight there who is eligible to vote under this. That is, any overseas, any U.S. citizen living overseas, whether that is for the military, for school, for work, for family reasons, uh, no matter how long a U.S. citizen has lived overseas, they still possess the right to vote in U.S. federal elections. That does vary on a state-to-state -state basis, whether or not people are able to participate in state and local elections, but every U.S. citizen, every dual citizen, uh, People, for example, in Germany who have German parents but have U.S. citizenship can still vote. If you have never lived in the United States but have citizenship, you can still vote. All of this is covered under the Act from 1986. All right, so now I wanted to turn over to overseas voters and their engagement particularly. Uh, we see that Again, overseas voters do possess the right to vote, but how often are they using it and how? Right. So uh, there are some different estimates. I think Professor Zika, you mentioned a different one at the beginning. I've stuck to the lower estimate here, um, which is that there are 5.5 million American citizens living overseas, about 3 million of which uh, are eligible to vote since they're 18 years or older. Uh, again, and this is an important, I guess, preface it to what I'm going to say, there is no official mechanism in place that tracks the U.S. population overseas. Uh, so again, these are all estimates. This particularly one comes from, uh, this, this one comes in particular from the Federal, Federal Voting Assistance Program, uh, which is a sub-branch of the Department of Defense who monitors military and civilian engagement of American voters abroad. So um, to stick for uniformity of the report I will be referencing a lot, which is the overseas uh, voter report from 2016 carried out by FVAP, their estimate is that 5.5 million uh, Americans are abroad and again 3 million who are 18 plus. So let's take a look at why these people, uh, who they are and why they're abroad. Uh, as you'll see, ages are relatively represented uh, in, in a similar structure to the U.S. We see an even distribution, more or less, of the population with the median age around 46 years. Um, let's see, just I have some side notes here. Uh, per containing, uh, pertaining to workers, we'll see that 64% are employed a uh, slightly smaller retiree population than the United States and also some who are not working. Uh, in contrast to the United States then, jumping over to the next graph uh, in terms of education levels, we'll see a significant higher percentage of the population who are what is considered in this graph well-educated. Um, we'll see the majority of that of Americans living overseas do possess at least a bachelor's degree, if not a higher degree. Uh, in contrast to the United States, we're looking at about 30% of the population who do have uh, a similar educational background. And again, uh, not particularly uh, of as much interest perhaps as age or education level or occupation, but also the reason for living abroad. Uh, 
we'll see that the highest percentage have moved abroad to be with family members, a spouse, um, children, for example, followed by employment and some other reasons like going to school. As I know, there are several people at the, the North American Studies program, um, missionary work as well, or retirement, particularly in Latin America, um, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala, have very high percentages of retirees living there from the United States. In contrast, in Germany, I would say the majority of people I interact with um, in the American, the American population are there for work, family, or going to school. Um, uh, much fewer retirees in contrast to what you would find in other parts of the world. Okay, so I just was highlighting uh, some of the differences in the overseas voting population, and this map now outlines where people are. So you'll see the biggest countries, and most logically, as you could guess, Canada has the highest uh, percentage of Americans who are living outside of the US, followed by the UK and Mexico. Uh, on this graph, Germany is coming in eight, just shy of 100,000 American citizens. This information was taken in 2016, and I did want to highlight that this has actually changed um, based on the data available from the Statistisches Bundesamt, we'll see that in Germany there are actually 121,000 Americans living here as of December 2019. Of voting age, it's about 110, 111,000 people. As a side note, this also ex largely excludes military and dual citizens. So this 111,000 number is based on the Anmeldung process, people who have officially registered in Germany as US citizens. However, military in many instances is not required to do that. Dual citizens may just put their German citizenship down. So if anything, the potential of the American seized vote, even within Germany, uh, is significantly high. And now we get to the uh, sad slide, so to say. Uh, in 2016, only a very small percentage of Americans living overseas were actually voting. 6.9% uh, of Americans actually cast a ballot in the 2016 race. Germany was slightly better, just shy of 17% in terms of voter turnout. And here I have this broken down by country, so you can see uh, where potential is, as I mentioned, Canada, as we saw, has the largest percentage of American voters. Uh, however, many of them were not voting. Uh, same for the United Kingdom, Mexico, other larger countries uh, with American populations, Japan, South Korea. Uh, you will see that Germany, in contrast to many of them, were, uh, you could say, overperforming. Americans in Germany were overperforming um, with 16.8%, however, uh, still falls short of where we could and should be uh, for the 2020 race. And now I wanted to shift and talk a little bit about why that voting percentage might be so low and what that means for us moving forward uh, through November. So particularly, there are three factors that are you can attribute to low voter turnout. And the first is opportunity, followed by ability, and then motivation. If you look at opportunity, uh, this is more or less ruled out due to the voting acts in 1975 and especially in 1986. Uh, previous to that, if we were talking in the 1960s, opportunity would be what we were focusing on. Uh, just because Americans as a civilian overseas did not possess the right to vote. At this stage, that is legally guaranteed for Americans living overseas. So in terms of opportunity, our focus, it is not our, our focus as much as ability or motivation. Ability in particular looks at factors. How easy is it for someone to actually cast a ballot? Are the mechanisms in place for me to easily request my absentee ballot? Uh, 
am I going to receive it in a timely manner? Am I going to be able to return it to the United States without problems and in a timely manner? So some of these, when we look at ability, we're looking at factors um, that, as you'll see below, we call the obstacles gap. So what are the obstacles uh, that are affecting Americans living abroad and preventing them from participating in the electoral process? We also have to look at motivation. Um, many Americans living overseas uh, are motivated to vote. <laughs> We're very excited about that, especially this year. However, uh, and I'm sure many of you who have lived abroad yourself, um, there is the question of identity that comes into this. Uh, do you still want to be involved with US politics? Or have you been living in Germany and become more German, so to say, uh, and become disengaged with your home country? And are you motivated to vote in that sense? Do you still feel an obligation to participate in the US political process? So that is a factor as well. Just to highlight this, uh, the overseas voter analysis from 2016 splits these two ideas of ability and motivation into two categories. So one, the obstacles gap, and secondly, the residual gap. And just to highlight what that is, uh, I, when we look at the obstacles, they define that as particularly those that affect one's ability to transmit and receive election-related materials in a timely manner versus the part attributable to motivation or other internal factors. And this is a graph that highlights that. So if we look at the domestic voter participation, which is around 71.9%, uh, and we look then to the overseas voter participation, which was, as I mentioned, 6.9%. Um, we'll see what's preventing them. And here, based on surveys that they took after the 2016 election, they concluded that about 31% of people had not been able to participate or did not participate because of obstacles um, in their way. So again, returning the ballot, getting the ballot in a timely manner, being able to submit it and uh, get it back to their local election office in the United States. Then we do see a large segment of the population who is covered by that residual gap. So people who were disengaged with the US political process did not feel compelled um, to participate in the electoral process. I will say that there is a certain segment of the population, um, and again, as evidenced by this graph, that does apply to, through my work with Democrats abroad, you will occasionally meet Americans who say, well, I've been living abroad for so long, it's really not my place to be participating in the US elections. Uh, I, of course, you know, have to come back at that with a counter argument that uh, as long as you do possess the, 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 the right to vote, that, uh, it's important to use it, especially this election cycle. Okay, and now I wanted to shift over and talk about the potential for 2020. But in order to do this, I think we need to take a step back as much as many of us do not want to uh, and look at the 2016 race. So as I mentioned, within Germany, we have 111,000 eligible voters worldwide, over 3 million. In 2016, the election was decided by about 77,000 votes, uh, particularly in the states of Pennsylvania, around 44,000 votes, Wisconsin, and Michigan. It's a very small margin that actually allowed Donald Trump to win the 2016 election. And when you contrast that with the potential of the overseas vote, that of course is very uh, motivating and encouraging for us to be making sure we're reaching every American who's living abroad. It's not to say that 2016 was a, uh, I mean, Americans abroad were showing up, so to say. Um, and there were victories that we can specifically attribute to the overseas vote uh, especially at the state and local level. So I wanted to highlight two of those, the first being the governor race in 2016 in North Carolina. Uh, in this context, we can particularly link uh, 
overseas voter turnout to delivering what we call the margin of victory. So Governor Roy, Roy Cooper, excuse me, was voted in and won by a very slim vote margin, just over 10,000 votes. Democrats abroad delivered over 27,000 votes uh, to the state of North Carolina that year. So had those votes not come in, uh, his victory would not have been as certain. Looking to the 2018 races, we see this again. Um, and here I wanted to focus particularly on a more state and local focused race again with Nikki Freed, who was the agricultural commissioner. I know that's not as uh, attention grabbing as a governor or a senator, for example, but this does highlight the importance uh, at what we call down ballot races. So races that aren't just for you know, the big races for president, senator, but also what's happening at the state and local level. Again, we'll see that she won by a very, very narrow margin, uh, just shy of 7,000 votes, and again, 48,000 returned from Americans living overseas who vote in Florida. As we shift our attention now to 2020, there are key races, and I'm sure they have been being discussed in this lecture series. Uh, our focus with Democrats abroad is not just on the presidential race. Of course, that is, you know, we are what we are all fighting for to get the White House back. But we are also looking at open Senate seats. Um, and here I've highlighted states where we particularly are working with state parties to ensure that overseas voters will be able to participate, that there will be um, again, that they will have the ability uh, to vote from abroad and work together to get those obstacles out of the way. So we'll see here particularly Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, Wisconsin. Uh, these are the states that are keeping us busy right now. And you won't see your normal, uh, it's not just some of the, the normal offenders, so to say, uh, obviously Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, they come into play, but we're seeing newer states gain increasing importance in Georgia with two open Senate seats, Iowa a Senate seat looking ever more likely uh, and reachable for Democrats. And again, the possibility of Texas finally going blue, not just purple, but actually turning blue is it's a goal. And I think that by getting overseas Americans to vote, that goal becomes uh, increasingly reachable. Looking to 2020, I did want to discuss some indicators that I believe are uh, encouraging for our work through November uh, that do point to better voter turnout, more voter engagement uh, on November 3rd. The first again is our, what we call motivator in chief. Uh, through my experience with Democrats abroad, working with American citizens in Germany, uh, I have seen people come out who have never been politically active. So some of the people who may have fallen under the residual gap, not voting because they are uh, not interested in the US political process, think it doesn't apply to them. Uh, at least not, maybe on a daily basis. Um, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, at least on a weekly basis at this point. Uh, I receive emails from people who say I have lived in Germany since the 1960s, 1970s. I've never voted before, but this election is just too important to pass up. Can you help me request my absentee ballot? And again, I think this is attributable to what we're seeing in the United States with Donald Trump's leadership uh, is that he, while there are many things I could criticize about his presidency and his leadership and his administration, uh, and I will just save that for the question and answer session. Um, he does motivate Democrats. If Hillary Clinton were in power right now, I honestly do not think we would see the level of engagement that we do. Uh, so he is very motivating in getting the overseas community mobilized. Just living in Germany too, I can tell you how many, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I was asked uh, what's going on in your country, what what is Donald Trump doing? Why did people vote for him? Uh, and that's just a question that has not gone away since 2016. 
And I, I know that does not just apply to me, but to all Americans living abroad. In one way or another, we have felt the impact of his presidency and largely in a, in a negative way, in my opinion, and that is a motivating factor. I did also want to highlight Democrats Abroad's primary uh, as one potential indicator for more engagement in November. Each election cycle, as the, let me take a step back, since Democrats Abroad is an official part of the Democratic National Committee, we also conduct our own state primary, known as the Global Presidential Primary. That counts just the same as a race in Pennsylvania or in Florida or in California. Democrats Abroad gets delegates and does send them to the convention in August to determine who our nominee will be. If we look at the global presidential primary in 2016 compared to 2020, we did see that Americans were participating in our primary at a 15% higher rate than they were four years ago. Particularly in Germany, we almost doubled our voter turnout, so we had 88% greater voter participation of Americans living in Germany uh, as compared to in 2016. And secondly, uh, going along with motivation and this momentum from the primary, uh, across the board we do see active voter engagement, online voter registration drives, and now in Germany we are returning to some in-person voter registration drives. Generally, there is this motivation factor, there is this sense of, I need to do something, how can I do it? And we've really capitalized on that and are running with it through November. So in my role with Democrats Abroad, Germany, I work to coordinate these efforts nationwide, give volunteers meaningful tasks to do uh, all across the country. And you'll see here the cities where we have active groups uh, who are meeting regularly, who are doing voter registration drives, who are out there canvassing their cities with vote from abroad flyers. Uh, so you might see some of those in Bonn, because I do know there's a group on the ground. And again, this is just, our way of still staying politically engaged and spreading the word that Americans overseas can't vote and helping them to do so. Okay, and I wanted to end with where do we go from here? What are the must do's through November? Looking at, again, the ability impact or, or the lack of ability to vote in 2016. That is a priority for our organization. So we're working every day to improve citizens' ability to vote. What that means concretely is that we're working with legislators and state parties back in the United States to ensure email return of overseas absentee ballots, making the ballots available online for download, and ensuring the functionality of the U.S. postal system, which as we've seen over the past few months is currently being chipped away at by the Trump administration to focus on ensuring uh, the ability to return by email. Again, that's to lower the, or minimize the risk uh, that something gets lost in the mail. We're speaking, I'm speaking from a perspective of Germany where we do have uh, a very, what I would call a very reliable mail system. However, many overseas voters are living in Southeast Asia, for example, in Africa and Latin America, uh, in countries who do not have as reliable of a, of a mailing system or postal mail system rather. So we're looking to push for email return that's currently available in all but 19 states. Uh, Pennsylvania is one of them that needs to be returned by postal mail, for example. And just to be clear, Democrats Abroad does not advocate for online voting. Um, so to say you would go to a website and click, I vote for this person. Uh, we're talking about still having a physical ballot that you would scan and return in an email attachment. Uh, that would allow for what we call a paper trail. So in terms of election security, there would still be verification of a ballot coming from, uh, you know, this person and just not uh, an online source that could be hacked um, if it were to be on a website, for example. Online ballot download, uh, what is meant with that is that I would not have to wait for my state to 
send me the ballot in the mail, but that I could go online and download uh, the absentee ballot and print that out at my own printer. And the functionality of the US postal system, I think is pretty straightforward, but again, uh, just ensuring that the postal system is working on the US end of things, that there still is a US postal system uh, so that Americans overseas who do have to return their ballot by mail can. And lastly, our work continues just by educating and supporting voters abroad. Many Americans do not realize that they have the vote to write, uh, <laughs> the right to vote, excuse me. Um, and if they do, they believe in many cases that it's too complicated. Uh, and while the fact may be that in the 1980s, 1990s it was, today this can, process can be completed entirely online. And I've listed one website where you can do that, voteforabroad.org in about 10 minutes. If you are a US citizen or a dual citizen, you can go there and do that right now <laughs> during the remainder of this talk if you want. Uh, I hope not, but definitely check out that website if you are eligible to vote. And if you do run into any questions, we have a team of election trained lawyers um, who work together with voters who encounter difficulties, uh, again, and provide the support and assistance needed to vote from abroad. So. That is about it from my end, um, and that is uh, from the background of the overseas vote and where we're headed. So uh, a lot of potential there, and I would invite all of you to tell an American if you know one <laughs> um, that they can vote from abroad. A lot of what we do is through word of mouth, um, so continuing to uh, educate and support voters. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Uh, this is, um, we can probably close the um, presentation, right? Yeah. Thanks so much, Ms. Kerstan, for this wonderful, uh, informative um, uh, talk, because I know, I think that we don't know much about uh, uh, voters abroad. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to compare it also how, how Germans fare in other places when they're not living in Germany. Um, something I don't know much about, but it, um, it, I was quite impressed when I first heard that it's only 7% that actually engage in voting. Uh, because one assumes that those Americans who are abroad are politically engaged, but you make plain evidence why this may not be the case and what the obstacles are, which we of course know of also in the United States. So. Um, we, we have time for questions, so that is great. We have actually quite a lot of time and I'm sure there will be questions from the audience and we're going to start with that. Um, everybody knows how to raise their blue hand and um, or also use the chat if, uh, if that is easier. So I would like to open uh, the debate. Uh, I do have questions myself, but uh, they can wait uh, and we have a lot of time. So. Um, Let's start with uh, yeah some of the student or audience questions. Yeah, um, I was sent a question in advance, so I'll start with this one. Um, it was from uh, Miss Kim Scheiler. Uh, she said, "I would really like to know how the votes from the people abroad are being counted with the electoral college. So how does this work? Does this, does it just refer to the votes of the?" like people who are present or how does it work? Yeah, good question. Um, so there are two components of this and they're different for the primary election versus the general election. Um, with the primary election, overseas voters have the choice of voting with Democrats abroad in the global presidential primary, as I mentioned, or voting with their home state. Um, so I, for example, voted with Democrats abroad uh, as an overseas voter, my vote went directly towards the delegates uh, who will go to the Democratic National Convention in August on behalf of Democrats abroad rather than uh, on Pennsylvania. If we move to the general election and look at uh, the Electoral College specifically, Americans overseas always have to vote with their home state. Uh, home state in this context, I guess I should phrase that more as voting state, so that is your last U.S. residence. Uh, if you've never lived in the U.S., that is the last residence of your U.S. parent or grandparent. Uh, if you were just born in the United States, 
that voting address can be the hospital where you were born at. Um, so for example, when I vote in November, I'll be voting from Germany, but my vote will be counted just like all the other absentee votes that come in in Pennsylvania. Okay, that's nice. Thanks a lot. Um, another question that was sent in advance is by Ms. Jan Bertelmann. Um, she is rather asking about the Republicans than the Democrats. And especially, um, well, I'll just read it out. Facing the current efforts from Republican politicians to destabilize Trump or criticize him in the media, for example, Bolton, Mattis, Nolan or Powell, how divided does the Republican Party enter the election? And is it possible that these internal tensions might influence the outcome of the upcoming election? Especially, I think, also um, as people from abroad see the elections going on and read the news but don't have access to like everything this might be even well more impressive to people who just look onto it from the outside well i would argue that uh, as an overseas voter we are paying attention to uh, to some degree of course some more than others me uh, being interested in political science and following it a little more closely but it is something that's become unavoidable uh, and this whole discussion of, well, what is the Republican Party at this point? Uh, I can tell you I've heard this numerous times since I've been back in Pennsylvania um, with people saying, that's not my Republican Party. It's not the Republican Party I used to know. Um, and I can tell you through conversations here in this battleground state that uh, many people are either not voting Republican um, as a symbol against Trump or switching to the Democratic Party. Um, again, it's hard to measure at this point just how mm -hmm. or the magnitude of, of that jump to not voting or voting for the opposition. Um, but I do think that it's a motivating factor. Um, you could argue that this split in the Republican Party um, of kind of the old Republicans, uh, we see several groups um, mobilizing right now, the Republicans against Trump. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so there is some division there. Uh, at the same time, I do want to be a little bit cautious in that uh, it's, while I am a member of the Democratic Party, I wholeheartedly embrace what we are fighting for. There are some divisions within our own party right now that are obviously of interest uh, with the progressive wing and what's going to happen to the Sanders voters. Um, are they going to jump to Biden? Um, so I think on both sides, uh, we see particularly particular leanings of the party um, as a motivating factor, or uh, I guess a factor for not voting. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Thanks a lot. Um, I think the next question is actually one uh, that will be posed by a student herself, by Ms. Rebecca Hart. If you want, you can unmute yourself and start talking. Um, I actually have two questions. Uh, one is about uh, whether there are statistics about how um, Americans abroad usually vote and maybe there are histori historical changes. Um, and also, uh, my second question is um, about the situation before um, the Act of 1986, um, whether um, uh, family members of military uh, uh, mi military members uh, had some kind of privileges and, for example, were allowed to vote or were they also exclu excluded? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for those questions. Um, I'll jump in with the first one about how Americans abroad tend to vote, what the statistics are behind that. Uh, as much as I would love to tell you uh, Democrats or uh, Republicans, their X amount of the American uh, population abroad, I can't. What I can reference, however, is where the overseas uh, absentee ballot requests, which party they're coming from. And that is repeatedly higher for Democratic uh, people registered with the Democratic Party. Uh, so, for example, in 2016, uh, if we jump back to that governor's race that I mentioned, 2016, 44% of the absentee ballots requested from overseas were for Democrat people registered as Democrats. 21% were for uh, Republicans. <clears throat> so the remainder were uh, not affiliated with either party, but we do see 
in the direct comparison of who's requesting ballots. There are more registered Democrats requesting them than there are uh, registered Republicans. In terms of how we vote as well, and this is again a personal opinion based on my experience in Germany, I think a lot of Americans overseas have experienced what it is that the Democratic Party is fighting for back in the United States. Uh, to me, living in Germany, and I'm very thankful to say that uh, the German society overall has prioritized uh, universal health care, low cost education, uh, low cost, high quality education, uh, prioritizing climate change. These are things that we know can be done. And from our experience, we're in a unique position to fight for that stuff back home. So I do think that also is a factor in how Americans vote. Um, and again, my personal take is that there is some preferentiality towards Democratic candidates and the policies they represent. Um, to jump over to your second question about military voting rights prior to 1986, uh, I cannot give you a concrete answer on that, uh, unfortunately. Military members themselves, uh, as I mentioned, have gained uh, absentee voting rights since the Civil War. Uh, I am not exactly familiar with the policies for their spouses, children, for example, um, but I, that's definitely a question I'm going to look into. Thank you. Very nice. Um, yeah, the last question I can see right now was uh, sent by chat again by Nivis, and uh, she's asking, is there any possibility to build up alliances between certain parties which are similar to the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in terms of building up alliances, uh, obviously in the US, uh, it is largely constrained to the two party system. There are initiatives, um, as we've seen from the Green Party, um, in particular as, as the most notorious third party um, in the United States. I do think that there's an incredible amount uh, of potential to build alliances, not just with divisions within the Democratic Party or within the Republican Party. I think a lot of the issues right now that we're fighting for uh, extend beyond party lines, uh, combating the coronavirus as we've seen. If that's something that's going to be done successfully is going to require bipartisan cooperation, uh, as well as a lot more uh, effective cooperation between the federal and state level of governments. Um, building alliances, I think that speaking specifically to the Democratic Party, uh, there's a subset now of the Democratic Socialists of America um, who are more progressive and progressive leaning, supporting Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, we just saw that in New York with many progressive candidates waiting across the board in their primary on Tuesday. Um, there is a space for them in the Democratic Party. Um, it's not this static body, so to say. In 2016, we saw many people come in from the progressive wing, myself included, uh, who have found a spot in the Democratic Party and have changed it uh, significantly since 2016. Uh, that's something that is taken into consideration this time around if we're going to make the jump from Sanders voters going over to Biden in November. There needs to be alliances made, there needs to be uh, compromises between the progressive wing and the more centrist uh, segment of the party. And I think that everyone realizes that. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, we can put up whoever and have this argument of person X against Donald Trump and everyone has to vote for person X just because it's not Donald Trump. Uh, I think we have all realized that that's not a convincing argument. This needs to be an election and that the Democrats are fighting for something, not just against something. And I think we have a lot that we're fighting for right now, be that universal health care, be that prioritizing the environment. These are things at the end of the day that require compromise. And the alternative is having someone in office for another four years who is not even going to give, you know, second of the day to thinking about these issues, in my opinion. So I think alliance building, finding compromises uh, is extremely important and is happening within the party.
And how about, well, parties, for example, in Germany, do they cooperate with either the Republicans or the Democrats, be, there, be that in, uh, I don't know, advertising something or organizing uh, events together? Is there anything like that? And could there be something like that? Because I mean, it would, I don't know whether this would be counted as a fair interaction. Yeah, so as uh, the Democratic Party overseas, we are not uh, permitted to cooperate with any foreign political parties. Um, mm. And we've seen the critique of the Trump administration and his campaign's work um, with foreign entities. Um, that is something that we've always prioritized. So as much as uh, I'm sure many of our members would love to be cooperating with parties in Germany and joining forces, we cannot do that under US election law. Uh, that's not to say that we don't ever participate in events with them. Um, we do do outreach events uh, with the Greens, with the SPD, some panel discussions as such, uh, but there's no coordinated effort between Democrats abroad and any uh, political party in Germany or in any other foreign country. Okay, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Um, yeah, and then I see a hand by Ms. Katharina Fackner. No, thank you, Ms. Karasen, for this really interesting talk. Um, I think my question has already partly been answered. Um, I was going to ask you whether you could say some more about um, sentiments among, I mean, you seem to be in touch with a lot of, with many voters, um, how people feel about uh, the different democratic uh, candidates in the primaries. Um, especially the um, the women, for instance. What what's your feeling? How how did they fare among uh, Americans overseas? Hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, the primary process was uh, certainly exciting. I don't think it happened how any of us uh, imagined, but I think that's standard for 2020 uh, in general. Always full of surprises. Um, I. In answering this question, I would say I'm going to take my Democrats abroad hat off for a little bit and um, speak to you just as a U.S. citizen who's living in Germany. Uh, we saw an incredible level of interest, particularly from the Sanders campaign and from the Buttigieg campaign. Uh, they were two, those two campaigns specifically had reached out to overseas voters, were creating their own, uh, you know, Pete for America in Germany groups. Uh, the Sanders in Germany group was incredibly effective at mobilizing people for the primaries. Um, again, I think our reaction to that was there was a lot of momentum, particularly behind Sanders, behind Buttigieg, behind Warren. Um, I would say those were the three top performers. Um, if you were to ask me in February where things stood. Um, for me personally, the primary process uh, <laughs> was a bit shocking. Um, I think everything happened pretty swiftly mm -hmm. in terms of where things stood in February and where we thought it was going. And then all of a sudden everyone drops out mm -hmm. and gets behind Biden. Um, again, personally, that was a shock to me uh, because there was so much momentum and excitement behind other candidates in Germany. Um, again, particularly Warren, Buttigieg and Sanders. And then they weren't there anymore. <laughs> so that did take some digesting, so to say, um, for I think a lot of, of Americans living abroad. However, I think that shock was, it has gotten better with time. Again, I think we have realized that the issues we're fighting for are bigger than who our candidate is. I do think that Joe Biden brings a wealth of experience um, to the Democratic Party. Uh, is a formidable opponent to Donald Trump. And the thing with Joe Biden is for voters who may not, where he may not have been their first choice, we know that he's going to put together a team of people uh, who will surround himself by, you know, his cabinet is not out there yet, his VP isn't out there yet, but by the Warrens, the Buddha judges, the Sanders. These opinions are going to be represented in his cabinet, um, and the ideas will still be going, you know, part of 
what he does going forward. So I think that, again, to go back to alliances and compromise, that's something that we have seen uh, just since the primaries. Thank you. If there are any further questions. Yeah. I, I can maybe jump in and there may be other questions that generate. Um, I have other questions, but, but since we were talking about the situation with the primaries and what's going on right now, is there a discussion in the, in the Democrats abroad about uh, the vice president? Any opinions on that? Or maybe your personal opinion, who would be a good pick? I mean, we're in the process and I'm, I've said this before, I find it quite interesting how women reappear that did not really make it in the primaries with often with the comment that they couldn't uh, win over Trump, uh, but now they're sort of you know picked to have people vote for Biden, and uh, mm -hmm. it's it's an odd process, I think. Uh, to and I I mean Klobuchar already said she's not going to make it, and I don't think Harris is uh, going to make it either. But is, is there a debate, or of course the things are changing so fast. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah, well, I guess the first clue that Biden gave us is that it will be a female. Yeah, um, we know that, yeah. There's been tons of speculation, uh, both at home and abroad, on who that's going to be. Uh, I wouldn't note, again, as we saw with Sanders and Buttigieg, this outreach to American citizens. We have seen that in particular from Stacey Abrams for some time, um, in terms of relationship building with Democrats abroad. And kind of getting her name out there, take that as you will, but Stacey Abrams has been very proactive in her mm -hmm. outreach with us. Mm -hmm. um, so I know she is at the top of the list for a lot of Democrats abroad mm -hmm. for that reason, that she has gone out and already mm -hmm. um, extended, you know, an invitation to join her in her efforts. Mm -hmm. um, being in the United States, if you were to ask me this, uh, back in April or May, my money would have been on Gretchen Whitmer from mm -hmm. Michigan. I think that particularly being in the US, it's made it evident that, uh, and you know this in Germany, coronavirus is not going anywhere. Um, when we look at the, what we're going to need to lead the country out of, or through and out of corona, uh, her state level experience in Michigan and leading that state in particular, I think would be very valuable to Joe Biden. Um, again, also coming from a swing state herself in Michigan, um, that's a must win for Joe moving forward. So I think that she would bring a lot to the table. Um, having said that, we do have Black Lives Matter coming into the mix now, um, and the African American vote is going to play a significant role, uh, and rightfully so, in the 2020 election. So uh, there are I would say more heavy consideration of African American female candidates, mm -hmm. um, and again, Stacey Abrams would uh, check the box there as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we will see, and I hope we get the announcement soon. <laughs> what do you think about Demings, Florida? That would be an interesting pick, probably too. So, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see. Uh, Ms. Hubs, did we get another question from the audience? Not yet. Not uh, yet. I mean, I came up with a question myself and I was wondering um, when you were talking about the development of these uh, yeah, American abroad movements, how come that the Democrats organized so much faster than the Republicans? And do you think this ties in with either which people migrate to other countries or with um, how the votes now look because people are just used to having Democrats abroad but not so much to having Republicans abroad and this is the reason why more Americans abroad often seem to side with the Democrats. What do you think? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So why was it the Democrats back in the 60s and not the Republicans who were organizing? And my initial reaction to that is it had to do with personal relationships. I know specifically in the groups in London and Paris, there were connections back to lawmakers in the United States. Um, and to be very open about this, in a lot of instances that had to do with donations to campaigns. Uh, Americans abroad could not vote, but they could donate. So there was a particular draw to reach certain communities 
um, again with London and Paris being large concentrations of them. Um, so I think it came down to personal relationships and who knew whom uh, and got the idea to actively go out and seek these people who are organizing already on their own. Um, again, not the answer that I, <laughs> I like as a, as a Democrat myself and uh, supporting the idea to get money out of politics, but it, uh, to be again very open, uh, that was a factor back in the 1960s of, of why people were gaining the attention. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, I'm maybe missing a second part of your question now, but I think the origins of it um, were related to, to personal relationships. Okay, no, the, the second part would just have been, could it be an explanation for um, now, as you said, more Americans abroad are or seem to vote for the Democrats than for the Republicans. So could this originate from having a movement of Democrats abroad for a far longer time than having Republicans abroad in such an organized manner? But I think as your explanation of how the Democrats abroad movement actually started is very different, mm -hmm. uh, this would be hard to really connect. Yeah, I would say since, since the 1960s though, the mission, as I understand it, of Democrats abroad, the goal of Democrats abroad, uh, really has become about mobilizing the overseas vote. So I think there were these foundations in the 1960s, but since then there's a team working around the globe of, you know, looking at voter protection, voter rights, voter engagement. Um, and in contrast to Republicans overseas, um, not to speak too much about them, but there is a difference, as I mentioned, in terms of recognition at the state level, but also in terms of fundraising. Um, since we are part of the Democratic Party, we do have to file with the Federal uh, Election Commission. We follow all of the FEC guidelines. We can only have members who are American citizens. We can only accept donations from US citizens. Uh, in contrast to that, Republicans overseas has a lot more wiggle room because they don't have to abide by that. Um, they can have German members, German contributions. Um, so again, there's this difference in the nature of both of them um, and how they've evolved since they've been founded. Okay, yeah, thanks for the answer. Um, in the meanwhile, I see that Ms. Anna Polinaski has raised her hand for another question. If you like, you can post it. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so I have a question about going, going back to Joe Biden's vice presidential candidate. Um, earlier today, I came across an article while doing research for another class, and they were talking about um, vice presidential candidates as well, and they mentioned Keisha Lance Bottoms. She's the mayor of Atlanta, and I personally was really surprised because I haven't really heard of her before, and um, they were making a point about why she would be a great candidate because, well, she's female, she's fairly young, and also she's black, and... Um, Apparently, she's been handling the corona crisis pretty well, so they were saying that she could be a potential candidate, and I was just wondering if you can say something about that, just because that was totally new for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her name is one that has been uh, popping up more and more uh, over the past month. She is not, uh, I think, in terms of familiarity, a lot of people, as I mentioned, are focusing on Stacey Abrams, on Val Demings, um, but I think just to highlight that again, and what this shows is whoever he's going to pick and why she's gaining uh, more recognizability within the party, greater consideration, it has to do with the, the issues that are really going to be driving the 2020 race. So in those, as you already mentioned, she has experience handling the corona crisis. She has really firsthand experience in the reaction to Black Lives Matter. Um, and those are going to be additions that are needed in Joe Biden's uh, team. So I would not rule her out. I think we're gonna need someone, again, who has experience in those two areas, uh, which are largely local and state issues, especially local. So while she might lack federal leadership positions, I don't think that disqualifies her, so to say, um, as a potential candidate. I think that in this case is, is very advantageous. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.
is there another question, Sams? No. Okay, no. Then, but I could ask another one. You, you talked about the motivation that people may have, like in Germany, you experience a different social system and a different political climate and so on. Um, I was also wondering uh, whether um, there is, of course, a lot of critique in Germany vis-a-vis -vis the United States, and we notice it, of course, when we look at the, uh, particularly when, when issues of racism are concerned, we have a very strong opinion. And, and uh, so do you think that may also be part of the impact to race, you know, the engagement? Because, of course, Germany has a long, or has a relationship since after the world, after World War II that has this transatlantic uh, moment very deeply written into it, even though it's changing, of course. And, and also relating to that, um, do you have any comparative figures? For instance, Australia has compulsory voting, right? You have to vote. And whether or not this sort of has an impact to raise you know the the motivation to vote or to even maybe turn it down because it might not be an american thing to be forced to to vote right mm -hmm. so it's probably very difficult to get these uh, um to say something about that but i i, I wonder there must be these national and cultural differences in mm -hmm. different places so. mm -hmm. yeah i guess my reaction to that would be um, going back to the motivation, and you mentioned the transatlantic um, partnership, and that is a unique experience that uh, you know everyone on this call has, um, as either a citizen uh, of the United States or of Germany, living in Germany. Um, I can tell you right now, concretely, um, just in some of the WhatsApp groups I'm in and the Facebook groups, we are seeing this the impact of the Trump administration on our personal lives. If you have not felt it, you're now feeling it because you can, you can return to the United States, but your return to Germany in your home, so to say, is uncertain. Um, I know personally for me, I had to return in the spring um, to the US temporarily and uh, things have changed in terms of US-German relations. Um, when Trump said the borders were closing from one day to the next without letting the EU know. Uh, Americans are paying attention to that, um, just as Germans are, but it, it, it's to the point now, with, especially with transatlantic relations, where, you know, if you weren't a business owner before, or you weren't, um, yeah, involved at some other level with transatlantic relations, it's now affecting you on a personal level. So I think that's certainly a motivational factor. Um, as far as overseas voter participation mm -hmm. from other countries where we do see mandatory voting, such as in Australia, I do not have figures on that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that's highly interesting. And actually, that's one of the things I'm going to be looking at in my future research. It's not just going to be overseas voting policy in the US, but mm -hmm. um, comparative. So looking at Australian population could be one of them. They're still being identified. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's certainly a lot of work to be done out there and a lot of valuable insights that can be gained by examining overseas voter populations. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. Um, thank you. Ms. Habs, any, any other question that came up? No, sorry, not so far, no. Okay, I volunteer. So um, I find it quite interesting that um, uh, overseas voting or voting um, or absentee voting was uh, established so early in the Civil War. And does one know how that worked? Did it work better with the postal system then than now? now? Or there must be some research on it or do, do you know anything about it? Uh, in, um, in terms of how it was actually carried out back then? Yeah, and how it, whether it worked, you know, so it's probably very hard uh, of how it worked. Mm -hmm. so. Again, I think it varied um, as uh, elections are largely carried out on a state-specific basis, mm -hmm. um, it did vary on where the soldiers were from. In some instances, there were, um, what do they call it, on-site voting centers um, mm -hmm. versus by mail. In terms of the percentage of how many were voting, mm -hmm. you know, 
in-person absentee, so to say, versus by mail. Um, I do not have those figures at the moment, but I would say that, I mean, even back with the Civil War, we did see what I would consider a significant expansion. Um, so concretely, we have the figure that at least 150,000 people mm -hmm. voted um, who otherwise would not have um, been voting in 1864. Mm -hmm. Um, and a particularly decisive election for the future of the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Ms. Alps, anybody else? No? No? Okay. Well, um, what is your prediction, uh, Ms. Karasan, for, for Pennsylvania? I'm, I know what your hope is, but uh, um, how would you think uh, will be the impact? on Pennsylvania in November of I, you know. I do think I, I do think it's going to be going blue and I've been very uh, I guess kind of the silver lining of being back in Pennsylvania for all of this is there has been a very significant shift again in family and friends uh, who previously voted for Trump have voted for the Republican Party for decades uh, things are shifting at least that's my vibe in my county which voted 74% for Donald Trump in 2016. I was telling Professor Zika before the call, um, I was very surprised at the level of activism uh, following Black Lives Matter in my town of 7,000 people. Uh, about 500 were out on the streets for a Black Lives Matter protest. Uh, so I think you might be reading from afar that there is a lot more engagement in rural communities. I can 100% confirm that I've seen it not just in my town of Huntington in Pennsylvania, but in many other smaller Pennsylvanian towns. And I think that's going to translate to greater turnout for Democrats in the fall. Mm -hmm. So I am hopeful. And I would add the plug, we're <laughs> going to see feel if we can get overseas voters voting. Uh, mm -hmm. If we show up, we being Democrats, if we show up on election day, we will win. Mm -hmm. So votefromabroad.org, please pass it along to your American friends living overseas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're perfectly right. That's the mo most important thing, that people don't stay at home. And um, uh, let, let's hope for that. Uh, so on target for you in the next months, you're coming back uh, next week, we heard. Um, what, what will be you know, on your schedule with regard to uh, uh, Democrats abroad in the next month? Yeah, so we have transitioned mainly on, uh, obviously, as you have done as well, to virtual events. We are running uh, at least bi-weekly voter registration trainings and office hours, again, to reduce that ability uh, obstacle. Um, so we're doing a lot of voter registration trainings. We're doing a lot of phone banking to Americans living overseas. Um, those 3.5 million, we're trying to find them and call them. And we have already reached a significant amount of them um, with current calling campaigns that will continue through election day. Uh, you might see us downtown, we're starting to do uh, get out the vote tables, so you can look for us at Munsterplatz, Friedensplatz and Bonn um, with our vote for abroad flags. Again, just a lot of, of efforts to find Americans and provide them with the assistance to vote. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that's very important work and uh... Wonderful, you're doing it. Um, Ms. Alps, any question that popped up? I'm sorry, no. Everyone okay, okay. Um, then uh, we don't have to drag it on, right? Uh, we heard so much. It was really, really interesting. And um, I hope, uh, Ms. Kirsten, when you're in Bonn and working maybe on your PhD or coming to Bonn for some event, Maybe we can hear a little bit about your PhD thesis. That would be wonderful um, uh, because, uh, of course, the engagement and the fight and the activism goes on, and your your scholarly work is right on on target. It would be very interesting to have you again. Um, and um, so, thanks a lot uh, uh, for um, coming in um, to Bonn for us, and also thanks, of course, to the audience for for many very good questions. Um, um, 
Before we close, um, I would like to take a look ahead. Um, next week, our guest will be, and it was already uh, mentioned, um, will be Ralph Seafreund, uh, who is the chair of the Re Republicans overseas. Uh, so we will um, see uh, the others engaging here. And then we've heard that they haven't done this for such a long time, which I uh, find interesting as well. Um, his lecture is entitled Enti and Entering the Battleground, a Republican Perspective on the Election Year 2020. Uh, you find all the information on uh, our website and on the website of our collaborators. So um, the audience out there, I hope you come see us again next week. Uh, be well and have a good night.